So good morning, everyone. Um, I'm, I'm very pleased to be here. Um, and I'd like to thank first the organizers, especially uh, John and, uh, and Michael Schneiders for, for inviting me. Uh, this morning, I'd like to uh, tell you a little bit about the, uh, the efforts that, we, that we've been making for the past four years to understand the uh, physical principles uh, that underlie membrane permeation. Um, <coughs> thanks. And um, so, yeah, so we've been working on membrane permeation of small molecules, and uh, I would like to tell you a little bit where we currently are. Uh, clearly not yet at the point where we can sell a tool to predict membrane, pro uh, membrane perme permeabilities. Um, what I like about this, uh, this workshop is uh, you don't feel obliged to uh, put a lot of glitz and glitter. Uh, you can actually, you know, tell, you know, when you meet problems, uh, kind of express these problems with the community. Um, so let me start uh, with a recap of, uh, of uh, uh, what I've been presenting in the, past, uh, in the past workshops and just give you uh, uh, an idea where we stand. So hell is paved with the best intentions. Uh, our motivation for doing this work was actually the, uh, the problem of drug attrition. And we were kind of hoping, maybe fooling ourselves, that uh, we might play a role in this. So you, you, you may know these this numbers that uh, uh, only 15% of the molecules that uh, enter clinical trials receive eventually marketing approval. Uh, in anti-cancer drug, uh, up to 95% of the drugs tested in phase one trials will not reach marketing authorization. And um, though PK, I mean, pharmacokinetics has become a lesser contender uh, in the field uh, to battle lower drug attrition, uh, predicting uh, permeability and bioavailability uh, as upstream as possible in lead discovery uh, remains in principle uh, of importance in, uh, in, the pharma, in the pharma industry. So how do we uh, approach this problem? So we uh, basically uh, rely on the uh, solubility diffusion model of permeation, which was uh, proposed back in 1994 by uh, Marink and Berenson. And um, so uh, the idea is to calculate the uh, resistance against permeation. So th this is the kind of uh, uh, molecular assay that we are using, so a simple bilayer. And we're measuring the, uh, the potential of mean force. So you have like two ingredients in your resistance. You have the uh, potential of mean force W of Z. Uh, and this potential of mean force will be measured as, the, uh, let's say, uh, along the, uh, the projected distance, Euclidean distance between the center of mass of the, of the permanent of the substrate and the center of mass of the lipid bilayer. And the other ingredient is the, uh, the diffusivity. And so once you have the resistance, of course, you have the permeability. Now, uh, I'm not making any claim on the choice of the, the reaction coordinate model, which is evidently a very simple uh, and ad hoc uh, representation of the, uh, of the reaction coordinate. But uh, this is the best we can do at this point. So how do we calculate the potential of mean force? I mean, everyone has its own uh, 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 favorite approach. We're using the adaptive biasing force. So the adaptive biasing force, for those who are not really familiar, uh, basically rests on the idea of uh, a, a connection between the uh, expected value of the force acting along the reaction coordinate and the gradient of the free energy. And again, I mean, you know, there is no miracle. I don't believe that there is a miracle uh, important sampling method. Uh, uh, they are all, whether metadynamics, umbrella sampling, adaptive biasing force, they're all plagued by orthogonal degrees of freedom, or what Wei Yang calls hidden barriers in the orthogonal space. And, and for that, I mean, uh, uh, there are specific strategies that you can use. Like in this case, we have a multiple walker approach whereby you kind of spawn replicas on your free energy landscape to improve sampling along your reaction coordinate. So that's for the, uh, that's for the uh, potential of mean force. The second ingredient is uh, a little bit more delicate. This is the, uh, the diffusivity. 
what we do here is, uh, so basically we, uh, the, the, the scheme that we're using is consistent with the, I the hypothesis uh, 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 of a Brownian propagator. So we, we, we discretize motion here. And then, um, and, uh, and, and then we're following this, this recipe. So uh, <coughs> we have from the adaptive biasing force uh, simulation, we have the trajectory along the uh, collective variable. And we also have the bias, I mean the biasing force that comes from, the, uh, from, from, from ABF, which we, which we collect. And so now we're gonna, uh, we're gonna pick some trial parameters. And so these trial parameters are the potential of mean force, although we don't need to uh, pick the potential of mean force, just a sanity check. I mean, ABF gives us the potential of mean force. And we also pick uh, the diffusivity. And now, we, so as I said here, we assume a, bro a bronium uh, propagator. And then we calculate the probability of the trajectory given the parameters, and then we apply a uh, Bayes equation. And uh, in a sense, basically what we do is we inverse solve the Smolikovsky equation, and now we get the probability of the parameters given the trajectory. And we optimize the parameter to, to yield the greatest probability using a metropolis Hastings um, uh, criterion. Now, this is all nice, but then we realize after a while that, uh, uh, so if we, plot, if we plot the diffusivity uh, uh, for different lag times, we see that uh, uh, there is no consensus of, of this uh, diffusivity profile as a, function of, um, as a function of the lag time. Incidentally, I, I, I put uh, here uh, uh, value. So uh, I what you see here is the uh, diffusivity profile obtained <coughs> from methanol crossing a POPC bilayer. Uh, if you look at the diffusivity that we, we calculate, we really overshoot. I mean, with a, with a classical force field, I mean, macromolecular force field like CHARM, we overshoot uh, the cell diffusion of methanol in tip 3P. We also overshoot the cell diffusion of water in water. Uh, so that's kind of a challenge. I mean, going back to the talks that we, what, that we heard yesterday, uh, and it's kind of an incremental challenge in the sense that we're not only targeting thermodynamics quantity, but we're also targeting kinetic quantity. <laughs> so maybe we're asking already too much to the, to, to the force field. So going back to the uh, uh, lack of consensus uh, in, uh, in the diffusivity uh, as, a function of, uh, as a function of the lag time, what we see here uh, is actually the diffusivity as a function of delta t at different uh, uh, positions uh, uh, in, the, in the liquid bilayer. So when we are far from the, uh, from the interface, so basically we are in the bulk, then of course we don't see any, uh, any uh, um, dependence on, on the lag time. Whereas when we are in the middle of the bilayer, there is actually, uh, as, as you can see here, there's actually a slope so that the mean square displacement along the collective variable is no, no longer linear with time, but is actually a parallel of, of, uh, of time. So this time dependence uh, of the diffusivity is kind of a hallmark of uh, a, a non-diffusive, in this case, sub-diffusive uh, regime uh, with uh, actually long correlation in space or long correlation in, uh, in time, or both, actually. Um, so uh, what's the physical origin of, uh, of this anomalous diffusion? So as I said, in water, we have, uh, when, when, we, when the substrate lies in the, in the water phase, we have a, a linear behavior. But now when we are in the bilayer, in the middle of the bilayer, so when, when, when I say uh, uh, linear behavior, that kind of translates to a Gaussian distribution of the probability to go from z to z plus delta z, right? At z at time t to z prime at time t prime. Now, when we are in the middle of the bilayer, that's a different story. So we have a superimposition of two regimes. We have long waits uh, uh, of a very uh, nearly immobile uh, uh, substrate. And then occasionally, we have long jumps, which you can see has a, some kind of a levy flight. Uh, and so uh, if I want to put this in a, in a picture, and you, here you have a little movie, and what we show here in purple are the formation of voids. So we have 
By virtue of this long time scale for the relaxation of the chains uh, of, the, of the lipids, you know, uh, they move very slowly, very sluggish, but occasionally they leave space to create voids. And when the, when the, when the substrate fills the void and it enters the voids and diffuses very quickly within the void until the void closes and then waits and waits and waits, which corresponds to this cusp in the distribution of, uh, of the probability to go from Z to Z prime. So uh, we, uh, we um, kind of uh, formalize this in the, and we call that the fractional solubility diffusion model. So it's a fractional version of the Smolikovsky equation, which gives you two things. It gives you the fractional order. And as you can see, what well, the fractional order is close to one in water and uh, 0.65 in the middle of the binary. It also gives you the fractional diffusivity. Well, so this is all nice and dandy, but uh, as uh, John Codera uh, asked uh, at the end of uh, two years ago, so at the end of the day, I mean, does it even make a difference? And does it even matter? Well, so I kind of, you know, made a hand-waving argument. I say, well, well, first, quite disappointingly, uh, numerically for small permanent, it doesn't make much of a difference. I mean, it's not like uh, uh, it, it, it's changing uh, a, a lot, the, uh, the numerical value. From a theoretical standpoint, I, I kind of believe maybe, you know, I'm, uh, a bit corny on this, but uh, if you have a correct method, then I think that you should use it, uh, especially if you want to cook up approximation and cut corners once you fully understand the, the underlying uh, physical principles. But, uh, but at least you should try to use the correct method. So uh, are these very expensive calculations any useful beyond the academic world? So that's kind of a, Yes, I, yesterday I was a little bit bummed down, you know, talking with people from industry. I mean, is it really useful what we're doing? And, and, uh, and, 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 and thanks to Woody Sherman, I mean, I, I got, got convinced that, yes, it might, be, it might be useful, certainly when we don't have the compound. We've, when we have the compound, then you can, you know, s use cell lines and high throughput cell lines. But when you don't have the compounds, then, uh, then, then it might be useful. But... What we're doing is far from, uh, from uh, 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 understanding the full process of you know, bioavailability. I mean, bioavailability is much more complicated. So when you talk about all you know, drug administration, uh, it's, it's very complex. And uh, so first, what we, what we are interested in here is uh, uh, drugs that are transported in a passive uh, fashion, so not through some dedicated uh, transport of the, of the GI tract. Second thing is bioavailability. What's bioavailability? It's the, uh, the, the fraction of a drug that you administer uh, uh, that will enter the systemic uh, uh, circulation completely unchanged. So that's not exactly what we are after. I mean, let's be modest. But what we're after is just like, uh, just see if the drug will go through the bilayer and uh, whatever bilayer we're using. Uh, so third, uh, f what, well, for protein ligand binding, uh, it's rather clear uh, what the experimental observable should be. Uh, uh, so as a basis of comparison with theory, I mean, we, we, we can compare with uh, data coming from ITC. And it's less clear for membrane permeability. I mean, uh, every company has its own favorite uh, cell line. I mean, uh, some use CACO2, some use NDCK, some use or CK, some use PEMPA. And there's even not a, an, an, an agreement between in vitro assays and in vivo assays. I mean, sometimes they disagree blatantly. So uh, it, it's a relevant question to ask, I mean, what should be the, 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 the basis of comparison for, um, for our calculations? So let me illustrate this with three, uh, three drug-like molecules that we've been working on. Uh, uh, with a POPC bilayer and then with a POPC bilayer with 30% cholesterol. So we chose these molecules because they have different properties and certainly they give you very different free energy landscapes which are kind of difficult to uh, reproduce accurately. Uh, one thing you can say from this calculation that's kind of a first take home message, it's impossible to predict the free energy landscape for these drugs based just, especially at the water membrane interface, based on bulk calculations. You have to do 
the, uh, the, 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 the potential of mean force calculation. So now, so what you see here are the potential of mean force, the key ingredient to your resistance or your permeability. So what's happening now if you add cholesterol? So you do the same simulation in a, in a POPC cholesterol uh, uh, um, environment. Well, you can see that at least for these two guys here, uh, um, what we call DDA and, uh, uh, and I mean, antrochic acid, ANA, uh, for these two guys, uh, there, is a, there isn't much change. And actually, if you look at the, uh, the variation of, of, the, um, of the permeability, I mean, we, it's changed by an order of magnitude, just an order of magnitude. Whereas in the case of hydrocortisol, I mean, we have an increase of the peak at the center of the bilayer, and it translates to uh, three orders of magnitude change. Incidentally, the experimental value that we put here uh, is from egg lecithin. So it's actually, actually difficult to find good solid uh, experimental value. Those are pretty, pretty, solid, uh, pretty solid values. Uh, so egg lecithin, in principle, is pure PC uh, with usually very little pollutant. There might be a little bit of cholesterol, but it's essentially uh, phosphatidylcholine. So first lesson is, uh, well, for these two molecules, the first one and the, and the last one, at best, we can get an order of magnitude, uh, assuming that the force field is, uh, is correct. Why are these calculations so expensive uh, and challenging? I mean, uh, if you look at uh, hydrocortisol, for instance, and the orientation of the dipole of this molecule as it moves across the bilayer. That simulation, incidentally, was very long. It's 6.3 microseconds to get a converged free energy profile. And by converge, I mean with a hysteresis between minus 40 angstrom and plus 40 angstrom of about kT or less than kT. Well, it has to undergo a major reorientation. And that, in a very sluggish environment, takes a lot of time. Actually, in the process, 6.3 microsecond is long. In the process, you can even see flip-flop of, of cholesterol going from one phase to the other. And occasionally, I don't show a snapshot here, but the flip-flop is accompanied uh, 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 with the, the, the change of orientation of, of uh, hydrocortisol, which kind of binds to the, uh, to, to the cholesterol. So should we even bother making, at this point, should we even bother making the theoretical model uh, uh, closer to, uh, to, um, to the biological reality? And uh, as we've seen already, that's pretty difficult to, to understand how the membrane composition affects the permeability for a one or two component uh, model. But if you want to be predictive, uh, maybe we should, we should uh, increase the complexity of the model. So we try that. And so we recently moved to uh, a mammalian uh, uh, lipid uh, membrane. And so the composition, we have 22 components. We have, uh, of course, the usual PC. We have a, a PE, ethanolamine. We have a, a <coughs> phosphatidyl inositol. We have sphingomyelins. And, um, and as a basis of comparison, we, we tried uh, different single lipid uh, uh, membranes. And so here is your mammalian uh, bilayer, which is the PMF is slightly asymmetric, although we anti symmetrize the gradient, which you see here. Uh, uh, even if you anti symmetrize, there is still uh, a little bit of asymmetry, and that's because the membrane is uh, by nature asymmetric. The composition of the upper leaflet and the lower leaflet <coughs> is not exactly the same. So what you can see here, looking from DLPC to mammalian, uh, we, have, we have indeed a, 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 an effect of the uh, membrane composition on the PMF, which certainly will impact the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the permeability. Uh, incidentally, I didn't mention that, but uh, the permeant that we're using here is very simple. This is ethanol. Uh, now, Conversely, if you look at the evolution of the diffusivity or the fractional diffusivity, this is pretty well conserved. Actually, there's not a big change across the, uh, uh, the, 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 the different assays that, uh, that we've used. And so if you look at, uh, at the evolution of, 
the, um, the probability, we have like roughly between mammalian, which is like the lowest probability, uh, we have nearly an order of uh, uh, two orders of magnitude, or 1.5 order of magnitude, uh, between the, uh, uh, the mammalian and, and, and uh, the, um, the fastest, the fastest uh, membrane. So now, assuming that these calculations are useful, and I'm not, again, making any claim that they are useful, uh, can we make them more viable? Can we make them cheaper uh, by reducing the cost of, uh, of, of the calculations that's, um, that we're doing? So uh, here are, I'm going to give you some suggestions. I mean, uh, um, a workflow, if you will, uh, to reduce the cost of, uh, of the prediction. So the first, uh, uh, the first observation is the diffusivity. As I said before, and, and it also applies to uh, uh, POPC with the, 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 the three uh, drug-like molecules, uh, we observe that pretty much the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the fractional diffusivity profile is, uh, is similar. I mean, uh, at least, you know, at, uh, um, uh, between minus 20 and plus 20, uh, you have this flat bottom. Uh, and then basically what the only thing that you would know, uh, you would need to know here is uh, the diffusivity in the bulk. And that you can get from a simple einstein smolikowski uh, 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 equation uh, uh, and, and, and a simulation in a bulk environment, in an isotropic aqueous environment. Now for the potential of mean force, um, so here I'm... Uh, I'm taking, uh, as an example, butanol-1 crossing POPC. So you have like this really illustrative of uh, the, the amphipathic nature of, uh, of butanol. So you have like this deep minima uh, uh, at the, uh, at the uh, interface in the, uh, in the head group region and a, in a, in a pretty small barrier here. So um, we think that we can model that with only five points, uh, one of which would be a simulation in bulk water to anchor the PMF. So we did that. Actually, we, we, we added one point, one extra point, kind of an overkill, but we really don't need this extra point. I think that four points, uh, so basically you work, at, you work with your membrane assay and you fix in space your permanent at different position uh, along Z, and, and then you do your typical alchemical transformation. You make your your substrate disappear and appear. You do it both ways. Um, and, uh, and then you can use a cubic spline uh, um, fit. Uh, we kind of like to use the Akima cubic spline. Uh, and uh, so in this case, there is a systematic uh, shift upwards. But I mean, you have to look at the, uh, at the scale here. I mean, we're talking about like 0.1 kcal. I mean, it's really difficult to exactly match the, maybe we can do it better, but uh, that was obtained uh, with the 40 nanoseconds each way, so for per point, so 80 nanoseconds for the bi-directional uh, uh, annihilation creation of the substrate. And so, uh, and, and, and then here's my, um, here's my uh, uh, approximation of the uh, diffusivity profile. And so if I plug everything and I do my integration, uh, I get 5.6 uh, centimeter per second uh, compared to the exact value of 7.3. So this is only one example. This is one data point. I mean, I don't want to do statistics with one data point, but I think that it's very encouraging that there might be hope to, uh, to reduce the cost. So if we can go like from 6 microseconds to 400 nanoseconds, it's, it's still 400 nanoseconds, but it's still better than, than 6 microseconds. So uh, let me give you a few take-home messages. I mean, so what we can do, I think that we, we are at the stage, although we don't understand everything. I mean, uh, obviously, like for hydrocortisone, we, I don't think that we uh, fully grasp what's going on there. But still, I think that with a properly parameterized force field, uh, at best, we can, we can offer solubility, uh, or based on the solubility fractional diffusion model, we can uh, offer predictions of permeability up to an order of magnitude. I don't think that we can go any closer than, uh, than an order of magnitude. It comes at a price. I mean, these simulations are expensive. I mean, we are in the microsecond, couple of microseconds, up to six microsecond regime. Uh, 
beyond the academic walls, well, it's still unclear whether, you know, the, these calculations are useful, especially in the pharma industry. I mean, as is, you know, out of the box. Uh, I don't think that you guys uh, uh, in, in, in the pharma world are ready to, to invest that amount of CPU to get one number, especially if you have the drug. I mean, if you have the compound, then uh, you, you can go to high throughput cell lines. What we've seen here is that definitely the permeability depends on the uh, membrane environment. So uh, uh, what's the meaning of, uh, uh, you know, from a pharmaceutical point of view, what's the meaning of a drug that permeates egg lecithin or a POPC membrane compared to a mammalian membrane? That's not quite clear. Uh, and finally, what I've, what I've shown here is that uh, um, that you can reduce the cost of these simulations by uh, turning to a more approximate uh, model. Uh, uh, I think there is hope there, I mean, uh, and we want to pursue this, this avenue. And finally, uh, the force field definitely remains, uh, remains the weakest link. I mean, we, uh, as we heard yesterday from uh, uh, Chris Bailey, for instance, I mean, the, uh, these force fields are still very rudimentary, and, uh, and when we talk about binding for energy, we're already asking them a lot, but now we're asking them even more because we want to be also quantitative for kinetics. And so, well, that's maybe uh, uh, something that we, we need to consider. Uh, I mean, force fields that address both kinetics and thermodynamics. And finally, I would like to thank my uh, collaborators on this, uh, Jeff Comer, who is an assistant professor at uh, Kansas State University, and Yi Wang in, in Hong Kong. And all of this started with, uh, with, uh, with a collaboration with, uh, with Klaus Schulten. And I would like to thank you for your attention. <laughs> Questions? In the back. Go ahead. So you mean like the substrate, for, for titratable substrate, you mean, or? For, yeah, for the, um, for your, uh, you want to reduce the, the least cost matter to the MVP, you know, at several days, so you can reduce the cost of the MVP, you know, at several days, but for the minute itself, it's, you know, it's a metric, and for a long period, it's hard to get it to, you know, to correct for that, yes. Yeah. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, yeah so, so I have a, I don't know if this it's is on. Okay. I have a maybe more provocative question. Please be provocative. I well, love it. So we talk about ideal, idealizations, and you talked about idealizations in terms of the composition of membranes that one uses, et cetera. I think there's growing evidence that, in fact, uh, biological membranes in living organisms may be sitting at a compositional uh, uh, critical point or near a compositional critical point and that the composition is fluctuating and that's largely driving the organization of receptors, et cetera, et cetera. You know, in that kind of picture, of course, anything we're talking about here probably doesn't have any real relevance. Do you think or do you not think? Or, uh, you know, even the mammalian membrane probably is very, uh, is very simplistic. I mean, um, for, for, for different reasons. I, uh, I think that because of the you know, overwhelming cost of these simulations, um, when I say that we have 22 components, I mean, let's not fool ourselves. I mean, we, when you have an 80 by 80 patch, some of the components are represented by one guy or two guys. So it's already, it's already a big approximation. But I totally agree with you. I think that uh, you have this <laughs> dynamic composition, I mean, constant change uh, in the composition of the lipid bio, which we do not even account for. I think that we're making some progress with respect to just simulating DMPC, but uh, 
but uh, we're still far from, from, from the biological reality. And, 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 you know, to this point, I, I'm not even sure. I mean, I, I, I like to hear people from industry telling me, you know, I mean, you're completely crazy. I mean, I would love to, to you hear that. I mean, you know, go home. I mean, stop doing this. Uh, uh. One quick question from Darren. Sure. Um, just to kind of follow up the theme, I mean, this is really, really interesting and, and, and rigorous work. One of the things about studying processes like this that I'm curious about and I don't know about is sometimes when we study these things, we're interested in, in finding some insights and guiding principles about what might actually be going on that, that are not directly uh, uh, observable experimentally. Where there's some motivating kind of <coughs> principles that you're interested in sort of pursuing in order to try and yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that's um, one of the things that we learned in the process. And uh, again, going back to the question of John two years ago, I mean, it's not like a game changer for, you know, the big picture. But we definitely learned that, that permeation, at least using the collective variable that, you, that we're using, which is rudimentary, does not obey Markovian dynamics. Uh, in fact, it obeys uh, a subdiffusive regime which can be handled by fractional uh, Smolikovsky equation. So that we're kind of happy in a sense, but it's kind of, <laughs> for, for, for pharma, this is not going to change anything, you know, whether it's fractional or not fractional, they couldn't care less. But for us, I think that yeah, we learned something. I mean, definitely by using this very rudimentary collective variable, we learned that it doesn't follow a continuous uh, time random walk. Yeah. We're going to have to save the rest of the questions for Chris for the coffee break, so Thanks. let's take it again. <laughs> Next up, we have, uh, we're continuing the theme of using free energy calculations for other aspects of drug discovery besides driving potency and selectivity. Uh, Michael Schertz is going to tell us a little bit about the polymorph problem.